So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're starting again with a somewhat irregular schedule. There's been a lot going on here and other things. So we'll announce the talk on the Picture Language website and we'll be going through sometime in May. We're extremely happy today to have Robert Wang. He's at Caltech and he's one of the leading young people in quantum information. So we're really interested to hear Robert tell us about certifying all quantum states with a few single qubit measurements. So Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a joint work with John Prasco and Mehdi Salamanifer um, about certifying almost all quantum states with few single qubit measurements. So as we all know, quantum systems with highly complex and intricate entanglement are very important for quantum information science, from performing classically hard quantum computation to implementing, say, quantum networks or creating beyond classical quantum sensing equipments. We have to create quantum systems that exhibit certain specific forms of entanglement. However, in reality, Whenever we try to do so, there's always going to be all kinds of errors and noise um, when, we, when we hope to create certain quantum system. So in order to understand and see if we have really created the desired target system in the lab, we have to perform a task known as certification. So for people that have never heard of certification before, Here's a very simple introduction to this, to this problem. So the task of this certification is the following. We have a desired n-qubit state site, which is our target state that we hope to create in the lab. So we are thinking of this site as having some very complicated entanglement structure um, inside of it. And we would like to be able to prepare them so then we can study its physical property for simulation purposes or for sensing purposes, et cetera. However, in practice, we're not going to be able to prepare the target state side perfectly, but we're going to be able to prepare some other mixed state role due to all the imperfections in the experimental systems. So the task of certification is to test if the state that we prepare in the lab role is close to the target state or not by analyzing data that we obtain from quantum experiments. Particular to check the closeness, we can, for example, um, quantify it by checking if the fidelity, psi rho psi, is close to one or not. If it's close to one, then we know we say that it's it's the two of them are close, and if it's smaller than one, we say that they're far. So this certification task is one of the most basic and simplest tasks in considering data science for quantum technology. One way to think about this is that, as I will talk about it later, if we can perform certification, we can perform learning. And when we can perform learning, we can do a lot of other things with it. So going back to this task, the task is very simple. We have a target state side. We have the experimentally prepared state role. We just wanted to be able to test if they're close or not. So I could ask, what, is, what are some procedure for doing certification? There have been a lot of existing techniques based on statistics or learning theory that have been proposed for performing certification. Some of them, you might be familiar and heard the name. Um, one of it is called XEB or cross-entropy benchmarking, which can be used for doing certification. One could also consider using classical shadow for performing certification, etc. However, there are it's still experimentally quite challenging to certify highly entangled quantum system due to um, various kind of problems that people face in using different techniques, which I will talk about in the following. So that means start with the first protocol for doing certification. 
So for people that are that have heard of classical shadow, one way to do stratification is the following. We take our quantum system, we scramble the system using some random Clifford circuit that we sampled, and then we measure everything in the standard basis. So that would be a single qubit measurement on all of it. But before doing the single qubit measurement, we have to scramble it using random Clifford circuit. And using this classical shadow formalism, one can show that by collecting these data for different random Clifford circuit and performing measurement, we can utilize these data to predict the fidelity. So we can essentially use these data to predict the quantity psi rho psi that I talked about earlier. And by looking at that quantity, we will be able to tell if we have accurately prepared the state or not. So one of the advantage of using classical shadow is that in addition to single qubit measurement, before it, you only need to apply a linear depth random Clifford circuit. And this is irrespective of how complicated the target state should be. One only needs to perform these depths and random Clifford circuit. However, the challenge from this approach is that implementing these deep random Clifford circuit can be quite challenging from an experimental perspective. And hence, um, this is not the most ideal procedure to perform in, in, in many physical platform to, to perform certification. Another approach, which is also based on these classical shadow formalism, is to perform randomized Pauli measurement. So instead of scrambling the whole system using a deep Clifford circuit, we, what we do is we just scramble each qubit locally. So that is equivalent to performing a single qubit measurement where for every qubit, we just measure in a random Pauli basis. So measure in a random X basis, Y basis, or Z basis. And using the same, form, uh, using this formalism, one can, again, utilize the measurement data to estimate fidelity. The advantage of this approach by doing randomized Pauli measurement is that it only requires single qubit measurement on row, but the challenge is that for target state that are highly entangled, then one can show that it will require an exponential in system size number of measurements in order to estimate the fidelity efficiently and to perform certification. So that's one of the downside of performing randomized Pauli measurement, where we just measure every qubit in a random x, y, z basis. Another related approach is based on cross-entropy benchmarking and has been studied um, in the original quantum supremacy experiment done by Google and also many, many follow-up works. For example, in one of the recent work um, by Sumon Choi, Emmanuel Andres, and others, um, they found that some variant of XCB can accurately capture fidelity and be used to perform certification under certain regimes. So the procedure here is very simple. We take the quantum system that we prepare in the lab, and now we just measure all the qubit in the Z basis. So what that gives is essentially just a bit string that we would generate from, from these measurements. And when we perform this for a measurement for a few times, we would get a few bit strings. And XCB is essentially a procedure that look at those bit strings and try to estimate a XCB score out of it. The advantage of this approach is that also it only needs single qubit measurement. And furthermore, not every single qubit measurement, but just single qubit measurement in the Z basis. So this could be particularly nice in various platforms. However, the challenge of XCB is that it doesn't really address the certification task rigorously. And this is pretty clear because all the measurements were done in the Z basis. So for example, if the target state psi has some of the diagonal elements, that's important. And the experimentally prepared state role says so not even quantum, it's just a classical distribution over bit string, then XCB could still produce a perfect score, even though the state that we prepare role is completely classical, um, whereas the target state psi is very quantum. So they could be very far, 
even though they have a perfect XCB score. And as a result, XCB, um, while in various regimes, it does accurately capture fidelity. Um, it, it doesn't really address the certification task fully in a rigorous fashion because it only measures the diagonal part of the density metrics so because it only performs Z basis measurement. There are also various other approaches, but all of the existing approaches um, have the following property, which is it either require performing some deep quantum circuit before doing the single qubit measurements, or if it doesn't have these deep quantum circuit, it would require an exponential amount of measurements in order to do certification rigorously, or it doesn't require deep circuit. It only uses polynomial number of measurement, but it only works for very low entangled state, like a state that can be represented by MPS, et cetera. Or if it doesn't lack a rigorous guarantee, so it's not clear whether it works. So this is the the the, the D part is really what XDB will will fall into. So as we can see, there are all of these different challenges in existing protocols, which raises the following motivating question that we try to study in this work, which is, can we rigorously certify some highly entangled quantum system by performing only a small number or a polynomial number of single qubit measurements? Or we can be more ambitious and ask the following question. Can we rigorously certify almost all quantum system, including ones that have exponentially high circuit complexity by performing only a few number of single qubit measurements? So in this talk, what I would like to do is to answer this question in the positive by providing a concrete protocol that one could implement um, experimentally. So the outline of my talk is I would first present the theorems that we proved in this work. I would then follow up with a simple protocol that establishes the theorem. And finally, talk about various applications of our protocol. So let me begin with the rigor statement. The first theorem we proved is the following. We showed that for almost all uncubed state psi, we can certify, we can check if the state experimentally prepared state role is close to the target state or not using only order n squared single qubit measurements. So note that this certification protocol applies to any state role. So no matter what the experimentally prepared state role is, if it is really close to the target, if it's close to the target state side, we will be able to say we'll, we'll be able to certify it. And if it's if there's some noise, there's too big of a noise in the experimentally prepared state role, then we will be able to say that it's far. And furthermore, a polynomial number of measurements is already enough, even when the target state side has exponentially high circuit complexity. So if the target state psi is just say a high random state, some highly entangled state, then the theorem shows that we still only need n squared single qubit measurement in order to perform the certification task. So while the theorem is nice in the sense that it says for almost all state, we can indeed certify them using a small number of measurement. In all practical setting, we will care about some specific state side that we would like to create in the lab. Like maybe it could be a GHG state, it could be a W state, it could be some other, say, cluster state or some other more specific state, like state generated by some chaotic evolution, etc. There will be some specific states that we care about. And we would like to be able to certify that we created that specific state, which the theorem actually doesn't say anything about because the theorem just says for almost all state, we can certify efficiently, but not any for some specific state. So in order to talk about a specific state, 
and the uh, efficiency for certifying them, we have to define a notion of realization time associated to a random walk. So essentially what I'm going to do now is to connect the task of performing certification to sort of the mixing time or the relaxation time of a random walk. So here, let's say we consider some specific target state psi over n qubits that we would like to prepare. And we choose some basis for representing that state. So note that there's a degree of freedom. We can choose the spaces, whatever we want. Um, say it could be just a standard computational basis, or maybe it could be the plus minus basis or the y plus y minus basis or some other one. But after we choose the basis, now the two to the n dimensional Hilbert space, we can just represent them by a bunch of, represent each of these bases by a bit string b. And what we're going to consider is this distribution, this probability distribution, pi of b, which is essentially the distribution that will be generated when we measure the target state psi under the chosen basis. So now when we think of this um, set of bases, we can think of, we can picture it, we can visualize it by the Boolean hacker cube that was presented below. So here I'm drawing an example for a three qubit situation. So there would be eight different bit strings and Boolean hypercube just connects different bit strings that differ by one bit. And now given a target state psi and we choose this basis, it would induce a measurement, it would induce a probability distribution over this Boolean hypercube, which is given by pi of b. And we should think of this pi of b as the kind of the stationary distribution of the random walk that I'm going to construct now. So here, let's consider some random walk on this embed Boolean hypercube. So say we start from a bit string b corresponding to one of the vertices on the hypercube. Say this bit string is just 0, 1, 0. The random walk is defined as follows. We will randomly pick one of the neighbor of this bit string. So note that there are three neighbors, or more generally, there will be n neighbors. And say we randomly pick one of them, so we chose b prime corresponding to this 0, 0, 0 bit string. So now the nothing has happened yet for the random walk. The 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 walker is still at point B. Now at this point, after it chose one of its neighbor, there will be a probability that it will stay at the point that it was originally at, or it will jump to the neighbor. Particular with probability proportional to pi of B, it will stay. And with probability proportional to pi of B prime, it will jump to the neighbor B prime. So note that the initial point that it's staying at is B and the neighbor that was chosen is B prime. So we're essentially just taking the conditional probability distribution associated to that edge and consider this jump. So it would either stay or it would jump to this neighbor. And that's the full definition of the random walk. Um, it's also a pretty standard one when we have a stationary distribution pi of b, um, a random walk that would give rise to this stationary distribution will be this random walk that I just described. Every time we just look at one of its neighbor and then we either stay or jump to that neighbor with probability that's proportional to the stationary distribution. So now what we would do is we will consider the time needed for this random walk, um, there's a typo, random walk um, to relax to the stationary distribution pi. So the realization time is given by the eigenvalue of the random walk matrix. But one way to think about the relaxation time is <clears throat> it's very closely related to the mixing time. That is, how many jumps do we really need to do we need to take 
what is the minimum number of jumps that we need to take such that it will converge to the stationary distribution. Particularly, the more precise definition is we will start at a point, a specific point, and consider a point distribution at that point, where that point is selected based on the stationary distribution, that we would just select one point. So at this beginning of time, it would just be a kind of a, a point distribution in the sense that it, probability one, it would be at that point. And then we would start doing this <clears throat> random walk. And we wanted to say that after time tau, it will become close to the stationary distribution pi. So it's the standard definition of relaxation time and very closely related to mixing time. So now what we can prove is given a target state and a chosen basis that re induces a relaxation time tau, then we can show that one could certify if the experimentally prepared state role is close to this target state, the specific target state, by performing order tau single qubit measurements. So this theorem essentially connects these two distinct concepts. One is a relaxation time when we consider the distribution um, induced by the state psi. And one is about how do we certify things? How can we certify if the experimentally prepared state is close to the, close to the target state? And this theorem too essentially builds this connection. And there's another kind of modified version of theorem two, where if we restrict ourselves to performing some Pauli basis measurement, then we only need a uh, tau squared single qubit measurement. But if we are allowed to perform um, other basis measurements, so not just Pauli basis, like measure in X, Y, Z, but some other basis, then it can be improved to just order tau. But in both cases, as long as the relaxation time is not too large, then one could certify efficiently. And the way we obtain theorem one is essentially by proving this additional statement that for almost all quantum state psi, except for like an exponentially small fraction of them, they have a relaxation time or a mixing time that is bounded by order n squared. So quadratic in system size. And hence, one will be able to certify um, these almost all states by performing only order n squared single qubit measurements. So that's how theorem one can be obtained from theorem two. <clears throat> So now what we'd like to do is to present the protocol that is needed to achieve the theorem that I just stated. The protocol is actually very, very simple. And on the measurement side, we just repeat the following for a few times. So we start with the experimentally prepared state row, and we're going to perform some single Q measurement. The measurement is chosen as follows. First, we will randomly pick one qubit, x. And for everything except for that qubit x, we will measure all of them in the z basis. And for that one remaining qubit, we will measure that qubit in a random x, y, z basis. And, and that's it. We just uh, do this measurement procedure for a few times and collect all these data and then there's a way to do certification. So now how do we use the measurement data in order to do certification? The post-processing look like the following. So note that when we fix one of the qubit x, let's say we fix the second qubit, like in this figure here, we fix the second qubit, so the middle one. And now when we perform a measurement on the rest of a qubit, it essentially specify n minus one bits. So for example, if we perform it and then it gives rise to all zero, then it would specify like zero, zero uh, here. Um, and for the remaining one qubit, it will be either zero or one. So by doing this um, Z basis measurement on everything else, 
it essentially created a post measurement state on this single one qubit that is given by some superposition or mixture between these two bit strings, B0 and B1. So that's what it means that the measurement outcomes on all these Z basis measurement will specify an edge on the Boolean hypercube. So now if we assume that we have done the experiment perfectly, then this initial state should be psi. And now when we perform the Z basis measurement on all these red qubits, the post measurement one qubit state on this qubit X will can be easily shown to be proportional to this state shown here. So it's really just uh, um, the target say psi, and we consider conditioning on B0 or B1. These are two bit strings that only differ by one bit, where for the bit that is differ, um, it's zero on B0 and one on B1. So these are just standard quantum mechanics. And using this randomized poly measurement on the qubit X, we can utilize classical shuttle to essentially predict the fidelity between the experimental post measurement one qubit state and the ideal post measurement one qubit state. So that's the fidelity omega. So think of this little omega as a single qubit fidelity. So it says fidelity on the single qubit that is conditioned on what is the measurement outcome for all these red qubits. And now we're near the end of the post-processing part. So just to quickly go through it again, so recall that the procedure is very simple. We just choose a random qubit. For the rest, we measure in the Z basis. And for the random qubit, we measure in a random X, Y, Z basis. And now using these, the outcome on these Z basis measurement, it will specify a target one qubit post-measurement state on qubit X which we can utilize the randomized Pauli measurement, this X, Y, Z measurement, to predict the fidelity. Um, so it's a one qubit fidelity here. And we will do this for a few rounds where we will choose different qubit and we will get different outcome for the Z basis measurement. We would also get different outcome for these randomized Pauli measurement on that chosen qubit. What we're going to do is we're just going to average all of them. We're going to average over these fidelity to get what we call the shadow overlap, which is just the expectation value of these single qubit fidelity. And now the key feature is that this new quantity, which we're calling shadow overlap, accurately tracks the fidelity. Particularly, we can prove that if the shadow overlap is close to one, then the fidelity would also be close to one up to like kind of a scaling factor that depends on the time it takes for a random walk to relax to the stationary distribution. And furthermore, if the fidelity is close to one, it also implies that the shadow overlap object would be close to one. And hence the shadow overlap can be seen as a surrogate of the fidelity where if the fidelity is low, <clears throat> then shadow overlap will have to be low. And if fidelity is high, shadow overlap would also be high. And hence, by checking if shadow overlap is close to one or not, we can check whether fidelity is close to one or not. And that's how the certification can be done. So now to just to build more intuition about the shadow overlap, they're going after going through the procedure that I talked about, there is actually a very succinct formula that can be written down that describes the shadow overlap. So the average over i going from the first qubit to the nth qubit just corresponds to we're choosing a qubit randomly. And then we're going to measure everything except for that chosen qubit. So here it'd be qubit i. We're going to measure everything else, which might result in a 
will well result in a bit string, an n minus one bit string with an associated probability given by this guy. And after we do this kind of partial inner product, this object that's written here, it would just become a kind of a one qubit density matrix, an unnormalized one qubit density matrix. And then we are just going to take the fidelity with the kind of the target one qubit post measurement state, which can be written more formally as this form. So we're just taking this one qubit guy and then this other one qubit guy and take their overlap and then consider something over different bit string outcome on the n minus one qubits. So now to build more intuition about this shadow overlap, we can look at some example. So say the target state is the O minus state, but what we actually prepare in the lab is the O plus state, so it's very wrong. And as we can see, the fidelity between these two states is zero. And when we plug it, the formula shown here into this shuttle overlap formula here, it's not hard to show that the shuttle overlap also gives rise to zero. On the other hand, when the target state is O plus, except for the last qubit is minus, but what we prepare is everything is plus there. So there's one bit, one qubit that was wrong. Fidelity would still tell us that the, that the inner product between them or the fidelity between them is zero because one qubit is off, one is plus and one is minus, so their inner product is zero. However, if one plug in these two state into the shadow overlap formula, we see that the shadow overlap actually gives rise to n minus one over n. So the way one should think about shadow overlap in this case is that it's essentially measuring like the halving distance between the target state and, and the experimentally prepared state. So in a way, it's a much more forgiving metric that when your one qubit is off, when you have n qubit and one qubit is off, it says it says you, your distance decreased by one over n. Unlike in fidelity, you would just say, oh, you 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 done everything wrong and you you get a score of zero. Shadow overlap says you have did most things correct and hence you would still get a good score. So it has this like having distance nature built into this metric. And hence it's one should think of it as like a like a surrogate of fidelity, but also not exactly equal to fidelity. Like this is an this is an example where they diverge. But the nice thing is that it's diverging in a sort of a nice way because now it can tell us sort of how much error is in the state that we prepare, rather than if we just have one bit off, then the fidelity just go to zero very quickly. So now after talking about the theorem and the protocol, I would like to showcase some applications of, of this new protocol. So what can we use this new certification protocol for? So the first application is very close to the one that I talked about earlier, which is for benchmarking quantum system. So we wanted to create a certain state, but experimentally we were going to create something maybe close to that state, but could also be very far if we did a bad job. Um, and what we can use the shadow overlap for is that we can now use shadow overlap to certify if the state has high fidelity or not. So here I'm going to present some experimental result for like numerical result, numerical experiment result for, for, for looking at how shadow overlap would scale. So here for this plot, we are considering a four qubit hard random state as the target state. And the experimentally prepared state is subject to some white noise. So the x-axis is the white noise. And as the white noise increases, the true fidelity should start to decrease linearly. And this is a regime where one can actually prove that XEB will work. And as we can see that the XEB, which is a blue one, does accurately track the true fidelity pretty well. And so does shadow overlap. The same holds for 20 qubit system and, and beyond. 
But this is under kind of the very idealized setting where there's only white noise um, and high random state. One could also ask, what, what if the system actually has some kind of coherent noise, not white noise, but some coherent noise that, that affects the system? Now here in this, re in this regime, there's no longer a guarantee that XCB would work. And particularly for the four qubit case, we see that as the coherent noise increases, the XCB score start to diverge from the true fidelity. It, it underestimates the fidelity. The fidelity is actually higher than what the XCB reports. On the other hand, shadow overlap tracks the true fidelity more accurately, even though at very high noise, there's also, it's not perfect. So there's also a bit of deviation. Here's another example, but for 20 qubit system. For bigger system, we see that um, both XCB and shadow overlap works much better. Now, all of these plots that I just showed are for how random state, but one can ask what, what if the goal is to prepare not a random state, but some more structured target state? So let's say we wanted to prepare some product state and subject by some kind of phase operation. So such a state arises when we try to pre prepare um, say states that's involved in this IQB circuit that was done in say Michel Lukin's recent experiment. So in this case, if we're subject to white noise for four qubit, we see that XCB still track the true fidelity quite well, but then it has a very big variance. On the other hand, the shadow overlap tracks it also very well and also and also has a much smaller variance. Here's the result for 20 qubit case. And then we can also ask, what if there are some coherent noise in a system? So that it's not just a pure white noise, but there are some coherent errors due to say over rotation, under rotation, or some other like atoms entangling with one another accidentally, et cetera. Now, in this case, this is really a case where XDB doesn't have any guarantee. Um, because it's a structured state and the noise is not um, white noise. Now XCB can really do something pretty crazy. And this is also what we found from this numerical experiment where we focus on this four qubit state and consider it subject to a coherent noise. As the noise increases, we see that the true fidelity start to go down. The shadow overlap start to go down as well, tracking it quite closely, although again, not perfectly. But somehow finally um, XCB just start blowing up a little bit. And here's another example before a bigger system for 20 qubit system. We again see that XCB is performing somehow um, erratically. Um, it's, it's instead of underestimating the, the fidelity, it's now significantly overestimating the fidelity. So here the fidelity is only 0 0.4, but it's reporting something that's close to 0 0.8. So these are just some, some experiments that kind of showcases in some of these states, more unstructured and structured state, um, how XCB and shadow overlap compares. Another example for using the shadow overlap quantity is that we can use it for certifying ML models. So there have been these flurry of results, um, very exciting ones where they try to utilize neural networks to represent quantum systems. And they try to, for example, train these neural network representation to, to learn and to do tomography of a quantum state. However, almost all of these neural network tomography algorithms are heuristic in nature. And sometimes they could fail miserably, but sometimes they also work very, very well. So in this case, it's very important to rigorously check if the neural network model is really learning the quantum system well. And here again, in order to certify these ML models, to check if the state that we learn um, and represent it using neural network actually capture the real experimental quantum system, we can again utilize the shadow overlap. We just estimate the shadow overlap between the trained ML model and versus the experimental system. 
if the shuttle overlap is close to one, we know that the neural network has learned well. However, if the shuttle overlap is far from one, we know that the neural network might have got confused or got stuck in local minimum and, and failed. So here I'll also showcase some examples for doing it. Um, the standard neural network quantum state looks like the following. It's a neural network that represents some unqubit wave function psi. And the way it represents it is pretty straightforward. It's just we say we throw in some bit string B the neural network would just produce a complex value that corresponds to the, the amplitude for that bit string. So that's the standard neural quantum state. However, what we found is that the standard neural quantum state has certain issue in representing states because some state have a lot of algebraic structure in it and hence it's standard neural network are not very good in manipulating those. So we consider it like um, a slight modification, still similar, um, where the neural network take in two bit string, and it just predicts the the relative kind of the relative amplitude. So the probability amplitude for one bit string divided by a probability amplitude for the second bit string. So this is what we actually consider in the numerical experiments I'm going to show. And by utilizing this neural network for n times, we just say start from some fixed bit string and then keep changing one bit at a time, um, we would get all these ratios. And we if we just mu multiply them together, we will be able to get the same, the same like probability amplitude. So this is a neural network that we're going to use. And what we consider here is we're training um, a class of a neural network quantum state for representing 120 qubits, uh, 120 qubits. Um, with very, very high circuit complexity. And there's a way that one can play with it so that it actually generates some exponentially high circuit complexity. So now if we randomly initialize the neural quantum state, um, what we found is that for the onsets that we're using, the initial state has no entanglement. In it. So here I'm plotting the subsystem and estimated purity. So the ground truth has a volume law entanglement in the system. So as the subsystem, so we're here we're really showing the half chain, half chain purity. So the purity will start to go down exponentially and stay very, very close to zero until we go back um, go back up at the at at the end of the chain. The random initialized neural quantum state doesn't have much entanglement in it. So the estimated fidelity, uh, estimated purity from them is it's all very close to one, meaning that there is no entanglement. What we're doing here is we're essentially utilizing a loss function based on the shadow overlap, and we train them, and train them to minimize these loss. And then we certify it using shadow overlap. So we just kind of check if the shadow overlap is close to one or not. Like for example, here, we're showing the number of training steps. And at the end of the training, we see that the shadow overlap, which is the orange lines, is very close to one, which also implies that the fidelity would be very close to one. And that's also what we see here. And hence, at this stage, we can get, make sure that shadow overlap has successfully shot, certify that the neural network has learned the system accurately. And hence, now when we utilize the neural network to make prediction about all of its different properties, it would be accurate. And that's also what we see here. So if we also utilize the trained neural quantum state, which has a fidelity that's very close to one, up to like three, four digits, um, the, the estimated purity um, from the trained neural quantum state accurately tracks the ground truth up to some statistical fluctuation. So that showcases the second example for, for certifying ML models using this new certification protocol. The third example is that we can also use this shadow overlap to try to optimize, like variationally optimize a quantum circuit to prepare a target state. So say we wanted to prepare a certain target state psi, starting from say the all zero state, and we would like to be able to find some shallow low depth circuit that can prepare a certain, prepare this target state. What we can do is we can also just take the shadow overlap between the currently prepared state and the target state and try to maximize it. 
So here we look at an example for trying to construct some uncubed metrics product state using the Hadamard and CZ and also T-gate. It's a universal gate set. So what I'm showing to the right hand side is when we just place the correct sequence of gates in order to create the target MPS. So let's say we already know how to create them and we just, we're just placing that one at a time. So what we can see here is that as we start to place all of these different gates, the, the state becomes closer and closer to the target state. But it's closer in, in not a fidelity sense. As we can see, for example, here, when we start placing individual gates, the fidelity is still very close to zero. It's all flat here. And only until the very end, when we start placing the right one, the fidelity really start going up very abruptly and quickly go to one. On the other hand, because of this Hamming distance nature of shadow overlap that we talked about earlier, we see that as we start constructing this state, the shadow overlap would already start increasing. And then it increases pretty linearly until the end. And it holds for both small systems and large systems. So this flatness in fidelity is also known in the variational quantum circuit literature as Baron Plateau. So because of Baron Plateau, it's quite hard to train um, circuits based on fidelity. On the other hand, the shadow overlap quantity has a more having distance flavor to it, and hence it's much easier to train. And here's a, uh, the, the plot for training a circuit to prepare some 50 qubit MPS using some Monte Carlo optimization method. So if the target loss function is based on fidelity, then we see that the Monte Carlo optimization is just random walking. So it's just random walking. The fidelity is always very close to zero and it never succeeds because it's walking on a big plateau. It is moving, but then it's just doing some random perturbation. On the other hand, if we train it using shadow overlap, because of its much nicer loss landscape, we see that the shadow overlap just keep increasing until the end and it gets a shadow overlap score of very close to one. And when we're doing this training, we see that the fidelity doesn't showcase anything. It just says, oh, it seems to not be improving, but actually we are. And then suddenly at some point we say, oh, we now perform very well. So, so, so this is a problem with fidelity. Um, it's that it doesn't really have a more fine grain kind of a picture for whether we're really closing in on our target. On the other hand, shadow overlap has this, it's a much more forgiving metric and hence it doesn't, at least in this situation, it doesn't suffer from barren plateau. So now to conclude, in this work, we proved that almost all quantum states can be efficiently certified from few single qubit measurement. And we've also conducted a plethora of applications for certification protocol showcasing that certification task is really one of the most foundational tasks in, in, in learning about quantum system, because if we can do certification accurately and efficiently, we will be able to do learning and so on efficiently. However, as one could also immediately see, our proof only says that almost all quantum states can be efficiently certified, but not all quantum states. So this raises this open question, are there are there some specific states that cannot be certified efficiently using few single qubit measurement? If the answer to this question is false, is negative, then it means that all quantum state can be certified with few single qubit measurement, which would be, I would find it very surprising. Um, however, we've tried quite hard in constructing some concrete example of states that are not certifiable with single Q measurement. But as of now, almost all of the, I mean, all of the states that we cook up, there's always some clever way to choose the basis, like the single qubit basis, or to consider some slightly more advanced version of the protocol that I just described to certify them. So, so yeah, so I would say, so this is really still an open question. And that's it for my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Robert, for a beautiful talk. I'm sure that there'll be some discussion. So for the moment, I'll stop your sharing and look to the audience and see if there are 
some comments from the audience. Please identify yourself if you want to speak. Eddie, I'd like to ask a question. Hi, yeah, Robert. Where are you? Right now I'm at Berkeley. I'm okay. visiting uh, Simons. Okay. But anyway, I'm a little bit concerned about what you keep using the word almost all. Yes. Because I really don't know what you mean. I mean, you know, almost all, if it means like hard random, I mean, it's not so interesting because, you know, all random, hard random states are just not interesting. I mean, what are interesting are states that are designed to solve problems, you know, the states yeah. that solve the factoring problem. I mean, hard random states, I know that many people are interested in them, but essentially they're un fundamentally uninteresting because they're just random. Who cares? And, um, yeah. you know, so I think I, I'd like to know more what you mean by almost all. Yeah. So, I mean, you're correct in that front. So that's why we have theorem two, which says if there is some specific state that you're interested in, then try bound its relaxation time under a certain basis. And this is what we also did in the in the upcoming manuscript, where we look at various specific state that could potentially be of interest to people, like or yeah. And then, and then, also and then have a, well, you have a full well that relaxation time. I mean, it depends on how long it takes the random walk to relax. And you know, you could make something yes. where that's very big. Because you can make, you know, random walks if you have low conductance uh, somewhere in the middle. You know, if I separate it into two pieces with a little bridge or something, I can make it not, uh, I can make the relaxation time tremendous. Yes, um, so it would be I, tremendous in one basis, but when you change it to a different basis, it becomes small. Oh, or that's, that's what you found. Like one example is just GHG state, which is like, it's on the it's like on the pole of it, and and if we choose a standard basis like the computational basis, then JT state has like infinite relaxation time because it doesn't mix like they're so so far apart. But then if we choose the plus minus basis, then suddenly the distribution that generated is rapidly mixing in like linear time. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. May so I, no, that's interesting. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no worries. So so yeah, so that's that's kind of. Really, why why there's that open question? It's like, indeed, like if we consider just a single cube measurement in a in a one fixed basis, then there are ways that we can easily cook up counter example where we yeah. cannot certify them. But if we now allow the ability to kind of change the basis as well, like single cube basis, so just maybe plus plus yeah. plus or some other ones, and suddenly it seems like they're rapidly mixing. Um, oh, that's also, interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. So let me. Can I, I agree. Go? Like, um, going back to theorem one, back, yes. going back to your question, um, when we say almost all, we really mean in the hard measure. So, yeah, but that's just. That I mean, there's, you know, I have to say that that's just sort of fundamentally not okay because, you know, so what? I mean, hard random states have nothing to do with, co with computation, and they have very little to do with anything you really want to do with a quantum computer other than you know, supremacy experiments, but otherwise, right. you know, who cares? Right. About all random states. I mean, yeah. So basically, I, I don't know whether you agree with that, but. I think theorem one is mostly for, um, from a more of a theorem conceptual picture that is interesting. Yeah. I think it just oh. suggests that maybe all state could be certified officially. Well, all is. I don't know how you're ever going to say all, but anyway, because then you have yeah. to put a measure. You know, you can only and uh, okay. May I? I don't mean to take much time, but can may I make another statement? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm very impressed with the fact that your measure um, is more like is 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 better than fidelity. I mean, an example is this. I mean, suppose yeah. you run an optimization algorithm yeah. and you want to produce a state. Uh, yes. a bit string and you have a million qubits and one bit is wrong yes right then the fidelity is zero yes but you know you're if you have uh uh you know a million minus one bits correct yes. you might have a very good solution to your problem so yes. i oh you know fidelity is just not a good way to check i mean if your fidelity is good you're happy i can't yeah. argue with that but your fidelity can be crap 
and yes. you could still be solving your problem. Like, you know, you showed before, you have one bit off. Yes. And so your fidelity is zero, but you have everything good about it. So, you know, if you can measure things in a way that's um, more forgiving than fidelity, but still yeah. a mat allows you to assert that you're doing a good job on what it is you're doing, I think that's very good, useful. Um, thank and you. Maybe, maybe there's somebody else who has a question. Yeah, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, no, no. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, uh, the question is, uh, uh, can you explain further how uh, Baron Plateau is uh, uh, solved or uh, or not encountered in in the uh, in the numerical result. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so that I guess you're talking about this third example. So it's very much related to what Eddie was commenting about. The, the, the final statement that Eddie was saying is that fidelity is really a, a very strict measure. Like if one of your qubit is off or a few of them is off. And suddenly your fidelity becomes very close to zero. And, and that's one reason that Baron Plateau arises. There are other reasons. This is one, one reason that Baron Plateau will arise. And as we can see from here, like when we are really implementing the right sequence of action in order to prepare a certain state, we see that the fidelity just keep getting zero until we're very, very, very close at the end of the construction and suddenly jump to one. And and this everywhere here is is Baron Plateau, so this figure here really showcases Baron Plateau in this way. Uh, on the other hand, if you we also plot the shadow overlap, and we can see that as we implement the correct sequence one at a time, the shadow overlap just keep increasing, increasing, increasing until the end it gets one. So so from here it's pretty clear that it just circumvents it because of its its native structure, that 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 shuttle overlap itself has a more forgiving nature in the sense that if a few qubit is off, um, then it just decreases a little bit. So here one could interpret it in two ways. Like one is that shuttle overlap is really not equal to fidelity. It, it's, it's, you can see that like in, in for the state that we just created here at the middle of the construction, the, the shuttle overlap is around 0 0.5, but then the fidelity is zero. So, so shadow overlap is really not exactly equal to fidelity, especially in this case, but it has a, it has this nature, which is it, it's not, yeah, it's much more forgiving and it has this hemming distance flavor in it and hence it circumvents Baron Plateau for this case. But note that Baron Plateau can arise in many plethora of, of cases. So it could arise when your cost function itself has this like Baron Plateau nature, it can arise if there's noise in your circuit. It can arise if your unsats for your state preparation circuit is too entangling, et cetera. So, so I would say it, it circumvents the part where we, we choose the metric. Like if we choose the metric to be fidelity, then and it's bad. There's bad plateau. And hence here, like when you train them, the using fidelity, it just kind of doing random work. But if you train them using shared overlap, it just kind of gradually goes to a good one. So I wouldn't say this fully resolve everything about Baron Plateau because Baron Plateau also have many, many other causes that at least um, it fully circumvents Baron Plateau in this kind of state preparation circuit experiment that we did here. So Adam Shaw has a question and then afterwards Bobak. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Robert, really nice talk. Um, I have two quick questions. So the first, can I think about this sort of other language that we've maybe spoken about before I sort of doing yeah. shadow tomography on like projected ensemble states in yes. some sense. Yes. Okay. That's how I, in a way, that's how the the project started. It was like we had this projected ensemble, and it was like, what if we do some combination of projected or like some combination? Essentially, shadow overlap, in my view, is it's essentially like a combination of XCB and classical shadow. So, so this quantity here, we're doing some XCB, and then. And then we have this projected ensemble picture for XCB. And then for the projected ensemble, we're doing classical shadow on it. So we're doing this randomized poly. And now we can actually get a faithful 
test of fidelity in a sense that we have this two thing. Whereas I think um like in 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 XEB, like if you replace this shadow of a lot by XEB, if the XEB score is close to one, it doesn't really imply that this is close to one. Because it could be that the off diagonal are off and so on. Right, right. Okay, that's very interesting. I guess my second question more practically is for these plots you show comparing XCP and the shadow overlap, you yes. show error bars on these plots? Are these yes. over par random states or over the random initial states that you picked? Oh, so here I'm always picking a specific state. Yeah. And these error bars are showing error bars when I perform measurements. Okay, so this is sort of, these are finite sampling error bars. Yes, yes, yes. These are error bars. I see. Okay. From finite. I see. And can you just give some sense of like, is it, are there large constant overheads and how many samples you need to take beyond this n squared number that you sort of theoretically prove? Or, or what is the ah. approximate, you know, practical number of samples you need for a given n qubit state? Yeah. So I would say the the one that I just showed, like this order n squared, that's likely a significant overestimate. Because um, here the proof is really we need to bound the mixing time. And the proof of bounding mixing time is very complicated. And that's why we have this n square scaling. Naively, I would expect this to be n. Like, or in many states, in many states of interest, we can, like, or many family of states, we can give them more kind of fine grain analysis and show that this is actually order n. So, so yeah, so I, I would expect a scaling of order n. And the constant in front, at least from all the numerics that I did, is pretty small. And furthermore, when the when the noise is pretty global, like for example, in in some of these, uh, especially these plots, I'm considering like some global coherent noise and global white noise. When the noise is global, I saw that it, it seems to be independent of system size. Oh, I see. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks so much for the talk. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bobak has a question. Oh, um, thanks for the talk, Robert. That was nice. Um, Thank you. I guess I also have two questions. Uh, yeah. First is, does this um, shadow overlap have a transport notion as well? Um, meaning, like, does it relate to certain complexity or Wasserstein distance of some? Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious about, so I, I'm not sure, like the formula is just shown here. Um, I'm not sure how it relates to at some point, I feel like it has some flavor of Western sign distance, but I'm still not sure. Um, so yeah, like I feel like this is so, like related in some way, but also different. So yeah, um, I see. Is it? Um, I guess that question for this to work, you need to know your target state, but there's probably your target state with respect to every bit string. Yes. Um, yes. Um, if I'm correct in saying that's a requirement, meaning like, yeah. could you say the state in another way? Like, I don't, I don't know what the ground state is some Hamiltonian or something. Would that just be a no go for this type of procedure? Ah, uh, so you mean like, to be honest, like if, if the goal, okay. So if the goal is to certify, if I have prepared the ground state of a Hamiltonian, that that's, that's like a super hard task. Like it's like CoQMA and so on. So it should yeah, yeah, yeah. be efficient. Um, um, so yes, uh, this doesn't cover that because I think that shouldn't be able to be covered. And, and yes, this does have to have this, like, for example, if, um, we, we need to like say given Hamiltonian, um, and we wanted to prepare the ground state, what we need is like, maybe we need to first use tensor network to optimize the Hamiltonian to get some target state represented in a tensor network. And now given a tensor network, we will be able to estimate these probability amplitude efficiently. And then we will be able to kind of certify it in the in the device. So 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 far all of these protocol, um, as well as a lot of them that we compare to like XCB, have to be able to like given some bit string, tell me what's the output, what is the probability amplitude for that bit string. So so that so far it's a requirement. How to generalize it beyond this is not clear at the moment. I think. So, so can I say so? So that means that just like in the supremacy experiments where you can't certify at 70 qubits, you would not be able to use this to uh, certify a uh, a supremacy experiment in 70 qubits. Maybe you need to certify IQP circuit, like this. Uh, IQP. 
Yeah. So like the one that Misha did, that's fine. But not like a Google one. But not the Google one, yes. <laughs> so I mean, the, 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 the not, like when I say not, it means like uh, it would have the same post-processing cost as XDB. Yes, that's what I was confirming. Yeah. Yes. But for some other state, which also have supremacy, like there are all these, like there's these collection of like constant depth circuit circuit that can prepare. Yeah. Like you can create state in constant depth such that sampling from it is classically hard. Those one could also use these to certify. IQB circuits are another class. I mean, the QAOA has supremacy of people's one. I see, I see. Yeah. So for example. <laughs> Because uh -huh. it's IQP. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then then <laughs> if I at e equal to one, then we could also yeah. simplify. <laughs> Arthur, you're muted. Oh Arthur, I think you're you're muted. Um, yeah. Okay. Can you talk now? Okay. Oh, uh, so I still have two questions. Uh, one is still about yeah. shadow overlap. Um, so if, if both low and psi are diagonal stable, will it be reduced to the classical Hamming distance? Oh, so actually, yeah. The interesting thing is if rho and psi are written in the okay. In a way, yes. So if rho and psi are written as plus minus spaces are diagonal in the plus minus spaces, then shadow overlap exactly reduces to Hamming distance, I think. I see. Yes. And also like for um for the theorem too, uh, um so how will the state depend uh you map it to uh um run work on the hyper field and then yeah. and then it is related to the uh relaxing relaxing time. Um yeah. How well the relaxing time tall depends on the, the state? Like, well, the entanglement has been some bound on the relaxing time or something like that. You mean, how does, and for example, how does the entanglement of state psi yeah. depends on relaxation time? Or Is that the question? Reverse direction. How well the relaxing time depends on the entanglement of, of the state? Or, or, yeah. So basically, what theorem one says is that you can have entanglement that's exponentially complex. And yet the relaxation time is upper bounded by n squared. So from this point of view, I would say maybe not. Like I don't think entanglement, even circuit complexity, is not going to affect the these relaxation time. What about magic? Yeah, what about magic? Um I mean all these hard random state has like exponential amount of magic. So, so even an exponential amount of magic, we can almost all state have like um, small relaxation time. So, so I think it also might not be an effect on this. I feel like it, the the closest one that might have an effect about relaxation time when we choose the basis properly might be like topological order or things like that. I think topology, like the topological order effect might have some kind of depend, like de dependence to relaxation time, but I'm not sure. So, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Eddie, I'm sure you have a final remark. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I was, I was texting. <laughs> yeah, no, worries. no, uh, no, I liked it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Robert, for a very wonderful talk and a lively discussion. I think we all enjoyed it and look forward to the paper, which will come out soon. Yeah. The future. Hopefully next. So bye-bye. See you next. Right. Yeah. Bye.